Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. When we think of a Muslim woman, the first image that usually comes to mind is a woman whose hair is covered, Dr. Shabir. So the question is, where did that whole idea come from? You know, we've seen recent protests in Iran over the headscarf and modesty laws. So this has kind of stirred up people's interest in the, in the subject and us too, because it's forced us to rethink, okay, well, where do, are there verses in the Quran that speak about how women should cover? Are there hadith? Where does this whole idea that women need to cover come from? So Dr. Shabir, I thought we could start a new series on this subject. Um, what do you think of the subject? Yeah, it's an interesting subject. And in fact, it's one that's being asked about again and again. Um, uh, women want to know, um, you know, is it God who said that we must wear this or that? Or was it re authentically reported from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Uh, or uh, might it have been a result of uh, what we call ijma or consensus of the scholars over time? Or maybe some of the scholars said this and some other scholars said some other thing, but uh, one view became sort of widely accepted and the other one slightly forgotten. Mm -hmm. Uh, so where does the idea come from? So uh, what, without uh, discounting everything from, from our past, we, we want to know where things fit. So uh, to start with what is most generally known, uh, almost in every book of Islamic jurisprudence today and on uh, uh, websites uh, that now give answers to questions that we will call fatwas, uh, they will all repeat the same thing, that uh, a woman has to cover all of her body except for her face, hands, and feet, according to the Hanafi school of Islamic jurisprudence, uh, but including her feet, according to other schools of jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. And in the Hanbali school, she must cover also her face and hands. And uh, uh, when she goes out of the house, uh, most uh, scholars will add that, yes, she should cover her face as well, uh, following uh, an interpretation of Surah 33, verse number 59. Now, how do we package all of this and, and how do we segment all of this into the various components? How much of it is from the Quran? How much of that is mentioned clearly by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, or reported uh, about him uh, in, in hadith? And how much of it comes from Muslim, scholarships, uh, Muslim scholarship and human interpretation, even a, a consensus of human interpretation over time? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Shabir, what's your analysis? Because when I look at the Quranic verses, to me it doesn't seem that clear that the rules that we have to today that the scholars have said, you know, women must dress this way, there must not be any hair showing, for example, um, must be a certain, you know, shape and size, right? None of that seems to be in the Quranic verses, the two that I have come across. So I'm wondering what your understanding um, how, how did these rulings come about? Yeah, so obviously we'll have to unpack all of this in, in the whole series of discussions um, under this topic. Uh, and in this series, we will have to look at uh, more closely some of the verses of the Quran that are uh, called into these discussions. Uh, most prominent among them is Surah 24, verse number 31. Mm -hmm. But we must add also Surah 24, verse number 60, which is an interesting uh, comment on uh, or connected to uh, the previously mentioned verse. We'll also look more closely at Surah 33, verse number 59, a verse which I've already alluded to previously, uh, in, in which some commentators see uh, warrant for thinking that women have to cover their faces when, when they go out of their houses. We'll look at Hadith as well. And it, it is interesting that the books of Hadith uh, uh, often have, uh, or, or most books of Hadith have, a, a chapter uh, entitled something like Kitabul Libas wa Zina, hmm. or just simply Kitabul Libas. Kitabul Libas means the book of, um, of clothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, while they call it a book, we think of it more as the chapter within the larger collection, but they call it book. Um, or Kitabul Libas wa Zina, the book of uh, clothing and uh, decoration or mm -hmm. adornment um, or fineries. So we will look into these uh, chapters, like in Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and some others, uh, to see uh, what do they say uh, are, are the requirements of, of clothing for, uh, for both men and women, actually, for that matter. Because when we're thinking about the, a rule for women, mostly people think that hijab is a rule for women. Um, but men have restrictions and requirements as well, though, though lesser requirements. 
And it's often not a problem for men to fulfill those requirements while going about in society. Mm -hmm. uh, but the women's uh, requirements are said to be so uh, much more involved that when a woman follows these requirements, the woman naturally um, stands out differently from the women in her surroundings, whereas mm -hmm. a Muslim man may go about his business and he may be undetected as a Muslim uh, from his outward appearance and attire. Um, but, but still, there are requirements, and we should see how these uh, books of hadith uh, navigate these requirements. How, how did they arrive at, um, at, at this, or rather, how did the scholars arrive at these details saying that the woman must be covered to this extent, that the clothing should be as loose as you are mentioning, um, and so on. Uh, and how do they uh, connect those uh, requirements with what is mentioned actually in the wording of the, of the hadiths in question? Mm -hmm. So all of that will uh, g give rise to a very useful uh, discussion mm -hmm. and a lot of rethinking about what people have taken for granted. And then, Dr. Shabir, one thing we haven't mentioned is the purposes, right? In the Quran, in the Quranic verses, there is reference to why God is prescribing certain things, right? I, I found that very interesting, right? Um, so, for example, so that you might be seen and not molested, right? That's one thing. Are there other purposes that are mentioned? And are these different from what were described later by the scholars? Did they come up with other reasons why a woman should be covered in, in a certain way? Yes, and, and did they actually neglect one of the um, original reasons? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, in other words, uh, you know, are we um, in this final stage prescribing for women um, clothing that may actually make them targets for abuse and, and molestation? Uh, so all of these uh, things have to be uh, put into perspective. They have to be uh, thought about carefully. In the end, we, want, we all want to obey God and, and to follow the way of his messenger. Um, and we want to make sure that we do that right. To do that right, we have to be careful about what we say that God said. If somebody says, you know, this is the Muslim woman's attire, and we ask, well, who prescribed all of this? And we say God, uh, we, we had better stop and, and listen to ourselves because did God say all of these things and all of these details or are some of these interpretations? And no matter how good there are, they are as interpretations, we cannot confuse them with the actual Word of God. We have to distinguish between what God actually said and what people have interpreted it to mean. Mm -hmm. An interesting part of this whole discussion, Safiya, um, it would, would be about how uh, to uh, think about women following the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You see, for men, if, if you want to know, okay, um, how do we follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, with regards to the beard, for example, okay, how was his beard? Uh, some Muslim young men want to comb their hair exactly as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon mm -hmm. him, did. I did that as a youth as well, <laughs> because I read certain books which I thought would be, you know, actual transcriptions of, like, almost like the transcriptions of video recordings of how the Prophet, peace be upon him, was. So if it says he parted his hair in, a, in, in the middle, for example, I did that for, for a long time. Um, and, you know, if it says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, grew his hair up to his earlobes, uh, I see some Muslim youth who attend some uh, Islamic uh, colleges, uh, they, they're doing the same thing because they take it for granted that these are good transcriptions of what the Prophet, peace be upon him, actually did. But now, let's think about women following the Prophet, peace be upon him. So those are men following a man. Uh, how do women follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, in terms of dress and attire and adornment and so on? Well, one might say, okay, but uh, we can follow his wives. Uh, and they are the mothers of the believers, and that makes sense. They, you know, we're copying our spiritual mothers here. Um, uh, but but there's, no, there's no clear uh, prescription in the Quran that we must follow the, the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Yes, the Quran calls them our mothers, uh, but but... The Quran goes on and on about following the Prophet, obeying him, copying him, imitating him, and so on, uh, but uh, not so much about following the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. In fact, I can't think of any particular verse that says that uh, we must follow the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I mean, it's, I mean there's a good logical inference that we should, that they're from among the best uh, earliest generations, and they lived with the Prophet, walked with him, they knew his internal domestic life uh, and his habits and all of that. Uh, so we get a, a lot of information by listening to them and by following them. We're following some of the best people in our uh, history, uh, but uh, it's, it's not a command from God. 
nor do I know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually uh, commanded people to follow his wives. Uh, so where would w Muslim women get the prescriptions of the uh, hijab from, like the, the whole uh, Muslim women's attire? We can say, okay, all right, they practiced it in a certain way, and for generations following, many copied the same practices, so those are good practices. But are they the only possible practices for women? Hmm. And is it uh, necessary because they did it? And I think hardly anyone would uh, be with good face to argue that because they did it is necessary. Uh, because usually we have to find something that is prescribed in the Quran or prescribed from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or clearly arises as a result of the use of logic and reason and uh, knowing what is good and moral and uh, ethically sound. All right, we'll leave it at that, Dr. Shabir. I'm looking forward to the series. Sure, me too. Support us today and help us share the message of Islam with people across the globe. Thank you, and may God bless you and your loved ones with the very best always. <laughs>